poetry, if you will, the Mallarmé, Des Coupes de Day, uh, the poem that's a kind of circular thing. I'll see if Josh can find it. But if not, I, I probably can make a photocopy and get it to us or something, scan it. And the other one would be Democracy by Arthur Rambo, uh, which is a very abstract poem, uh, but it's kind of nuanced, and I think it goes a long way with some of these things that we consider democracy today and where that was coming from. It's his kind of both critique and both positive and negative movement with the French Revolution. You know, it's a very ambiguous poem. But I thought it would be interesting because in different ways, these are reactions somewhat to Hegelian closure, which I don't believe in, you know, a teleological Hegel, but this was, these were part of the reactions to the teleological Hegel. And when I use the word, I mean teleological, I mean where there's an end, right? The, the beginning, the result is in the beginning, this kind of thing. So the teleological reading, I want to stay away from, right? And that's why I put out the email that actually juxtaposes and sets up a tension between speculative philosophy, or the beginning of speculative philosophy, versus that of teleological, or the end of philosophy, right? And this is based, both of these are based on the, the notion that Hegel is the closure of Western philosophy. That from the Greeks to Hegel is the closure of Western metaphysical tradition and of the conceptual history of the West. That Hegel has put a finality to this, right? So the question is, is this a teleological moment, right? Or is it open-ended and still is the beginning of a new type of philosophy, which is about speculative reason. So this is one, one thing I really want to try to look at in some ways. Uh, is there a radical break completely with empiricism? You know, is there a radical break with the empirical, right? This would presuppose that radical break, a rupture. here that we know through the senses, right, and the common sense, impressionistic way we go about stuff, and also at the same time we can put in there the radical break of uh, uh, positivism. In this context, I want to, since, you know, we're dealing with the radical imagination and very much that of the Marxist tradition, Gramsci's study of philosophy is also an attempt to do this, right? And uh, you can see this in his essay, or his prison notebook, Study of Philosophy, which was done in 1931, uh, uh, Study of uh, Philosophy and Historical Materialism, which is an attack against common sense empiricism. Um, you know, and, uh, and also an argument in Gramsci's case with uh, the historical school, Soviet school of sociology with Bukharin. So anyway, I want to I want to you know keep that in mind too. It's a radical break, speculative philosophy here, right? In, in some ways, uh, with uh, common sense uh, empiricism, and also a radical break, uh, you know, and, and you know, two with reified thinking. And as most of you know, this is Lugash. Richard Lukács, History of Class Consciousness, 1923, Reification and Class Consciousness of the Proletariat. Also tremendously influenced by, by Hegel and reified thinking. So there's a break with that. You know, Lukács takes up a break with common sense empiricism, probably the best example, at least in the giants of the tradition. You would see it in Gramsci. You would also see this in, in Lukács you know, in terms of how they play off of, um, play off of, um, of, of Hegel in, in this sense. So, um, again, uh, on the teleological, the closure here, this could be the right wing Hegelianism and uh, Fukuyama being one example of this, the end of history which set up in 1989 the 
PNAC moment, which we're still living through, project for a new American century, which was the theoretical underpinning of the State Department, you know, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The end of history was the end of, quote, the Eastern Bloc, <laughs> the end of, you know, East-West divides, the end of communism, the end of, you know, any kind of socialist insurrection. So th these are the theological right-wing re re readings. And, you know, of course, he takes part of this point of departure, and this would be interesting to look at more in detail, but Alexander Kozhev certainly influenced Fukuyama because he also spoke of Hegel's closure in terms of the teleological end of history. That Hegel had brought history to the end, that really what needs to play out then was the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and in Kozhev's case was the Stalinist moment right in the Soviet Union that somehow communism would finally come, come to be. Kozhev went back on this in 1960s when he went to Japan and said the only place and the only possibility that we have is Japanese snobbery. He used this term. It's very interesting. Against that, uh, because he said communism was the consumerism in the West, the consumerism of uh, American way of life. That's what he thought communism had become. Everything is delivered. All the goods are delivered, all the material goods. And this is his observation and one of the ways, you know, he went. In 1945, he became a Gaullist, right? And, and, and at the same time in this 1945, he began to write the general agreement on trades and tariffs, which was the pre pretext for the Euro, you know, the European Union. This morphed into Maastricht and, the, and then the EU. So many of this is connected going way back to the Hegelian <laughs> dialectic of history, right? You have this right-wing movement, right? And in some ways for Fukuyama and a whole group of American conservatives, uh, you know, in, in this group. Also in, in France as well, this is picked up. But Fukuyama becomes the major, major figure, right? The major figure behind PNAC, again, project for the new American century, of which Trump is the latest manifestation. Make no, no uh, bones about it. And interesting to me about Sanders, what has been completely suppressed in terms of what may have happened over the weekend leading into Super Tuesday, is with, with Sanders' comments about APAC. These people got on the phone like nobody's business and made sure that the Democratic machine would go to high gear and get Biden going, you know? Yeah, going against APAC. Yeah, what's please, it, I'm, I'm listening. Yeah. What's, what's it? Oh, it's the American uh, Jewish uh, organization, right wing Jewish organization. Very pro Israel, very pro. Oh, yeah. I've yeah. never heard of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, they're a very powerful group. They've okay. had a lot of, you know, if you get into the teaching machine, you know, they send people into classes that, you know, you, you begin to hear a lot about. <laughs> Their, uh, their, their gyrations. They actually cost Norman Finkelstein his job, who wrote on the Jewish Holocaust, whose family was a, a victims of the Holocaust, who wrote a book on the Holocaust industry. They made sure he never got a job. He's, he's, he's uh, adjuncting at uh, Brooklyn College and needs money desperately. This was a professor at DePaul that they moved out. You know, and they've gone after many people, Palestinians and other people, you know, who made these kind of comments. So this is something that Sanders, as a Jew, right, came out and said, you know, that th these are people he does not respect and he will not, uh, you know, ignore. He also called Netanyahu a racist. Yes, well, that, that's another thing. Yeah, on top of everything else. Yes, of course. Yeah. So anyway, but the project for the New American Century had people like Crystal, you know, uh, William Crystal, um, uh, whose father was a Trotskyist turned, uh, uh, turned, uh, you know, capitalist, uh, you know, etc. And uh, uh, his mother was a, 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 a um, I think an anthropologist, a, a Himmelfarb was her name, who um, worked, excuse me, on Darwin for most of her life. She wrote a very long book on the Darwinian uh, moment. Uh, anyway, these were all people responsible in this group, whereas the left was, was over here. Right? I know it's, I did it to the right towards, you know, us, right? But if you think about it this way, it's just you projected it out, it's on the left, on the board, it's on my right hand, I, I, I deal with the left first. 
Yeah. So anyway, this this was the left thing. What I would consider speculative, you know, Hegel left and right, if you will, in the modern era. You know, going back to this left-right distinction, you know, of course, in, in Hegel's time, you have Bauer, right, Bruno Bauer, Max Stirner, who are reactions that Marx confronts in 1845, one year after this, by the way, the German ideology, in the, the, the second and third parts. And then, um, of course, you have Kierkegaard, who became the religious, you know, one, who said Hegel thought everything out in terms of thought, but he forgot one part, man. So this is another thing that uh, you know was taken up by a whole religious, both left and right, including uh, including liberation theology. So I'm, I'm just trying to trace you know some of these influences, but why I'm developing these these kind of new notions that you would have the teleological Hegel or teleological reading, right? Because what we're really involved in here is, you know, radical interpretation, trying to reroute and maybe develop new concepts. At the same time, you know, I would like to stick with the notion of the speculative reason, right? That the absolute spirit, right, in, in many ways, is really capital. It's not just a moment. It's structural, it's historical, and it can also even become methodological when you see this absolute spirit playing out. It really is the capitalist order in so many ways, right? And this can be read as a symptom, structurally, historically, and, you know, methodologically. This is where I'm really trying to go with this, mm -hmm. if you will. Give it a kind of newer reading, uh, you know, that's a little more accessible to us and a more, more meaningful in terms of where we are, uh, you know, historically now. Um, you know, but this is the inauguration, you know, reason, this is reason at work, you know, reason, since this is the section we're involved with, reason. And one of the reasons I don't think, you know, uh, Hegel is teleological is the reading, and I wanted to go there tonight for a little while, Antigone. Um, I'm, I suppose everybody's familiar with the play Antigone, the great drama, the tragic drama. And Antigone's, you know, conflict, if you will, is between you know, the law of the state, on a, on a, a very immediate level, the law of the state, um, which is exemplified and represented by her uncle, both her great uncle and her uncle. You all know the story of the incest and all of this. You know, the Creon, the king, who is poor in power, the Tecanolese. The other brother is Polynices, who she loves, right? Who tried to pull off a coup d'etat and he killed his brother, they killed each other really in battle, right? And Creon, the uncle, became the king of, you know, Thebes, right? And Antigone dares to bury her brother, who is basically an insurrectionist, right? Against the law of the state. So she tries to bury a traitor to the state, right? He, that's what he is, yeah? fighting his other brother to take over, right? So, Creon, of course, gives her the death penalty, right? She's broken the laws of the state. Right. Now, what plays out in the drama is the law of the family. This is very Hegelian, because if you look at another crucial text of his, Philosophy of Right, the other part that Marx reads very carefully besides the logic and the phenomenology, in the Philosophy of Right, Hegel talks about the family and civil society, right? And then the movement to the state. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, the state and state thinking is very important for Hegel, right? Mm -hmm. In a way. And the law of the state, and some right-wing and even some left-wing readings, you know, have always put up that speculative reason or reason leads to the real is the rational and the rational is the real leads to the state. Right? The state is the final arbiter of reason. So in some ways, Hegel finds himself in a real dilemma with the Antigone, because Antigone represents the law of the family, I will bury him, he's my brother, right? versus the law of the state. But at the same time, she speaks about how Crayon has broken the law of the divinities. So there's this other law that is not quote unquote on the books, so to speak, not part of the state law. So in some ways, Hegel 
is in a speculative position. It is not teleological where the conflict is simply between the law of the state and the law of the family, but is, a tri is more of a triadic relationship, you know, between the law of the family, the law of the state, and the law of the divinities, right? Not that we have to believe in pantheism or the law of the gods, but there's something else that becomes part of, you know, the speculative risk, risk or we could say in Hegel, the remains of contingency. There is that contingent moment because what happens in Antigone, everybody knows, right? The crayon ends up, you know, completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. His wife commits suicide, his son commits suicide, right? Mm -hmm. right? Antigone is buried alive, right? And crayon is completely de destroyed at the end. So in a way, the Antigone does not resolve the problem of the state because it shows the state in some ways is a worthless, you know, worthless, you know, formation at the end of this uh, journey or what Antigone poses to it. So I, I, I want to, you know, kind of start there. I know, um, I know I didn't tell you to read um, um, Antigone. I just want to make one other remark. To me, a lot of this morphs, if you will, into the Grundrisse, I mean, I'm, I've been thinking about this a long time. This, this morphs into Marx's Grundrisse, into the concept of the general intellect. That speculative reason could be relanguaged in some ways in terms of general intellect. And this is Negre's school, right? The, the reading of Negre and Marx beyond uh, Marxism, as well as um, the, um, the, the, the notion of, of a, a general intellect as being you know, the replacement for reason in history, right, itself, right? So, let's keep that in mind too. But, again, yeah, the attack, the, the, what, what was that? Sorry, nothing. Sorry. Okay, the attack is against the common sense empiricism and the reified thinking. The reified thinking will have you only thinking in two dimensions, family versus state law, right? <laughs> There's another thing that's going on that's outside, outside of the box in terms of law, right? What is, what is the law, you know, et cetera. So we're gonna maybe try to talk about that a, a, a bit tonight. Um, also, I mean, going just for a second to the Hegelian influence on, say, on Lacan and others of that school, Antigone becomes a crucial document. It's no longer Oedipus is the founding document of psychoanalysis, but Antigone is the hysterical woman, right, in classical tragedy, right? That Antigone faces her death, but does so in a very, you know, hysterical way. And also the whole culture, the law of incest, is broken, right? The fundamental law of the symbolic order, which is the law of the, you know, you know the Freud's thinking about his very imagined origin of civilization, huh? that the sons revolt against the father and they, they, because the father controls all the women and all the, you know, goods and possessions, so the sons kill the father and form the brotherhood. Uh, but they feel they figure out they need a law, so they no longer are able to sleep with their sisters, right? So they set up the law of incest and this, to Freud, is the beginning of civilization, the law of incest. So, you know, that we're based on murder, right, of the father, the killing of the father, as well as the eating, they eat the father too, cannibalism. So a base basis, according to Freud, this is what we're cannibal, we are barbarian. It's not socialism or, or barbarism, <laughs> to go on that title. According to Freud, it's socialism and barbarism in a way. <laughs> it's not a whole, it's not an either or framework, at least in my mind. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more so too. But it's interesting that, you know, Antigone becomes uh, a, a, a kind of crucial text in the 19th century because Freud's uh, brother-in-law, um, Bernays, Martha Bernays is, uh, I think her, bro her brother, um, and Freud's maybe um, uh, either brother-in-law or cousin-in-law, uh, wrote the most prize-winning essay on Antigone. And if you won, won prizes in Germany in the 19th century, especially in the late, it meant you had a very original <laughs> take on stuff usually. So he has this very famous essay on Antigone, the reading of Antigone. So well, this becomes a very, yeah. 
Bernays. No, no. What yeah. was uh, what was remind me of um, Heidegger's take on uh, Antigone again? His rereading of Antigone. What was the big shift for him? Well, it, it, for Heidegger and Antigone, it's Holderlin's reading, and this brings us mm -hmm. back to something else. So let me let me put up Antigone as a reference, if you will. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm going to be all over the place, but it's okay. <laughs> Uh, Antigone as, as the play, you know, and for those of you who don't know, uh, this has been rewritten many times in history. The two most fundamental rewrites of the classical drama are Bertolt Brecht, after the war, and Jean Ennui, the French writer. These are two very impressive rewritings of the character of Antigone who stands up in the resistance. Right? Mm -hmm. And becomes a, you know, and, and understand, they understand the relationship to the state. Most of our readings of Antigone in the West are really about character, eth ethical order, these kind of things. We don't read it really as a, as a document of a rebellion against the state. Just like in uh, Hungary, one of the great films, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, uh, is uh, Electria by Miklos Jasto. Just an absolutely beautiful film about Electria is not about just avenging her father's death, you know, uh, by her mother, Clytemnestra, and her lover, Augustus, but it's really about Electra freeing the people in the state that were living under tremendous oppression under her mother and her mother's lover, you know, yeah, when they took over from her father. And this is a very beautiful drama, you know, if you ever have the chance to see it. Electria by the, by the Hungarian filmmaker Miklos Zsánszta. It won the Cannes Film Festival Award, I think in 1971 or 70. Yeah, 70, 71, right around that period when things were still, you know, on the insurgent level. You know, <laughs> the, 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 the tidal waves were still coming, right? Yeah. Anyway, so anyway, Antigone goes through many rewrites and all of that, but going back to what Josh mentioned, yes, Heidegger's interpretation and the relationship to Hegel again is really through Holdrowing. His, his best friend, right? Uh, Hegel was very close to Frederick Holderly and, of course, to Shelley. They, they, they planted the Tree of Liberty uh, as young students together in Tübingen uh, in Germany. And Holderly was the great poet, right? And his great poem, one of his great poems was, uh, was called uh, Hyperion, right? And which was about the, um, yeah. Hey. Um, which was about uh, the uh, return home, you know, active nostalgia. Mm -hmm. So what Heidegger does, Heidegger wants to deconstruct basically anthropomorphism in, in, in history, right? Even including the early Marx and Feuerbach, which right. are anthropomorphic texts still. Mm -hmm. um, so he goes back to Antigone where the chorus is speaking and the meditation is about what is man. And in Greek, man is anthropos. Okay, okay. So the question is posed, what is the anth anthropos, I right? Agree, yeah. And nothing so strange, right. nothing so, you know, um, dominative mm -hmm. as this category called man. Mm -hmm. And it's a very beautiful part. Mm -hmm. It's called it's called the stasimo in the play. And I mean, maybe I should have had us read Antigone, but but anyway, it's a, it's a it's a, just a wonderful play because it meditates on everything. You have hymns to Eros, hymns to death, to the Dionysian, all of this punctuating the action of the thing. I mean, I think it's his greatest play, much better than Oedipus. You know, I think it's the superb tragedy of all of all the Greek tragedies. It's tight. It's it's beautifully woven, the chorus, you know, does this wonderful commentary on all of the action, uh, etc. So this is the chorus speaking, which you're right. referring to, which is really a meditation on what is man, mm -hmm. right? Remember. What is man, right? Which is a long this, this, this is where Heidegger wants to go. He wants to destroy the teleological as well, even though he comes from another aspect of the right wing, the conservative revolution, yeah. right? I mean, you know, Junger and Heidegger. You know, Heidegger's the professor, Junger's really the conservative revolution, right. you know, in, in many ways. Heidegger's just the professor. I don't think he knew half of what was coming down during this period, <laughs> you know, in a way. I'm serious. But Ernst Junger was in the, in, the, in, the, in the ground, you know, he was fighting. On the line. Yeah, he was on the line. He was the line. Yeah, yeah, he was talking to Heidegger about the line. Yeah. Yes. 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is again another under-theorized, under-thought-of position among the left. You know, to see these tensions going on in the 20th century between, you know, the, the revolution that succeeded so far in the 20th century is the conservative revolution. Yeah. You know, I mean, the Nazi, the National Socialist, Heidegger in some ways right. It, parading around does not really speak to the inner greatness of the conservative movement. You can reread that introduction to metaphysics that way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This was an idea that came out of Germany after Hegel, the folk principle, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> etc. How do you mobilize this energy? You know, it's a kind of you know you can go back in my my mind all the way back to Luther, right? And Hegel did say, I want to do what Luther did to the Bible makes it speak German, I want it to do to philosophy. That was Hegel's goal early on. As a young man, he wrote things about this. He's, he's, he's really concerned in terms of his mission to make philosophy speak German. Right? This is what he did. Right? He did. Yeah. Yep. He accomplished that. Yes, I, I think so. <laughs> he did. He did. Yes. And, then, and there's some great books. Unfortunately, this one's not translated either. Called Hegel and the Greeks mm -hmm. by Heideggerian, which is very interesting too, <laughs> in a sense. But I mean, like it or not, with all our due respect to the, the Bolsheviks, <laughs> all our due respect to the Latin American, uh, whatever, the right. German mind is still operative out there, like it or not. Yeah. You know, I mean, everywhere, you know, everywhere. in some ways. Certainly in philosophy and science, right? And I don't know what else there is, you know, in, in terms of that. So, you know, this is worth studying to see where, where we are, you know. When you really think about this period, how much we're still interpreting. The Kant, Baumgarten, you know, mm -hmm. Winkelmann in art history, right? We have, of course, then Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, right? All going through you know, the deviations, the left and the right wing Hegelians, of which Marx is part of the left wing, you know, and then overcomes it. I, I, you know, these are just markers. I, I don't, adhere to this dogmatically, but, you know, anyway, when you really think about this, and then you think about what happens, uh, you know, late in the, and Schleiman rediscovers Troy, Germany invents Greece, you know, the modern, <laughs> modern Greece is, the, I mean, I'm Greek and I'm saying this, they, they invent it, they invent it, in many ways, they invent it, right, <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, they reinvented it. I mean, if it's not for Schleim and going to the, the archive, yeah, et cetera. I mean, his reactions to that, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the Greek communists are blowing up Nazi compounds, but it wasn't the Nazis that invented Greece, you know, they, they tried to yeah. play on it. Yeah. yeah. And then the Germans took all the gold. Yes, they did. Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. So, so anyway, but to think about this in terms of, you know, Hegel becomes kind of the epitome, if you will, right, or the highest level of this kind of making ancient philosophy, right, and philosophy itself speak German. But to speak it in such a way that it's in movement, it's not static. This is the thing about dialectics. It's not going to stay static, you know, it's not a stasis in motion. So what I'm trying to break up here, and I'll hopefully be able to write this out uh, well, <laughs> Um, to break up these teleological static relations of Hegel, right? Mm -hmm. That there's closure. And many Marxists, especially the dogmatic Marxists, adhere to this teleological way right? that Marx, that Hegel's just an idealist and Marx turns him on his head. You know, this is part of the teleological reading. You know, this is a bad reading, in my opinion. Whereas Lukács is able to take a lot of the Hegelian dialectic and work with it in terms of the reified thingness, right? And the, and the Kantian thing in itself, and show this at work, right? How Hegel will try to overcome this, right? right? At the same time, you know, taking on common sense empiricism is another example, too. Kant, Kant goes after this, too, but it's not as successful as, as Hegel. Because the common sense empiricism that we dealt with, to go back to this other thing that I put out in the email, as a developmental narrative, you know, when I talked about this as the story of sense certainty, perception of the, th you know, or the things deceived, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, force and understanding, all of these are moments, right, in, in terms of empiricism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
and he's criticizing this in, in a sense because what does the empiricist do? My senses tell me that I'm certain that this exists, right? In so many ways, it's not a, it's not a you know quote a strategy of reason. It's a strategy of arguing from the position of the senses. Yeah. So we're gonna we'll talk more about this because you see a return to sensuality with Feuerbach when he criticizes Hegel. We'll see this in the Marx. In the early Marx. Yes, in the early Marx, when we begin to see this, right? Where this comes back full circle, but not through empirical right. channels, not through Sensual. the empiricism, right? In a sense. Okay, so, I mean, I don't know, is this making sense to you somewhat? Uh, yeah. I mean, you can tell me. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm, I'm here for you. I mean, I'm serious. I'm serious. I, you know, I, yeah. I like to be, you know, <laughs> oh yeah, like that. Oh, okay, all right. Well, you're my kind of uh, person then. That's good, good, good. All right, all right. Well, I'm, I'm trying to kind of situate again, you know, because I know. Look, I mean, to spend you know at least two, three years line by line with this text is the way to master it. We don't have that kind of time. And secondly of all, I would like you know, in some ways, for us to take away from this as much as we can in terms of today's world. How does it help us orient? where we are, you know, how can we reread it and rethink it in the quote, post, post light or whatever light we're, you know, occupying right now, you know, and, you know, how do we see our ways out, you know, using some of these critical weapons. Uh, that's, that's my, that's my uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, moment here. Um, so, um, um, anyway, um, so I want to, yeah, I also want to get away. I know I did this thing earlier. It's not a Bildung Roman, right? Even though I mentioned Rameau's Nephew mm -hmm. as being a very important book. And you and the art world should read this mm -hmm. because it's about a complete parasite on his patron. It's a very interesting uh, text, uh, you know, written by Diderot of the French Enlightenment, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, um, uh, but it could be framed, you know, as a Bildung Roman for pedagogical purposes. It's a philosophical journey at work. There's an apprenticeship at work. So you could read it also as this kind of apprenticeship in, in, in philosophy as well, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, it's excellent to me uh, if I, you know, in some ways had it to do over again, so to speak. I mean, you know, if I had a lot of time to go back and say, okay, I'm going to reorient my education and kind of rethink it in a way. I would begin my philosophical training with Hegel, hmm. reading his lectures on the history of philosophy, right. reading somewhat of the phenomenology, and then I would go back to the Greeks. Mm -hmm. And then I would go, after doing that, I would go to Heidegger, etc. And you know, I think of the periods, of course, you know, what is his relationship to the medievalists, what is his relationship to, you know, uh, you know, of course, the Cartesian moment, uh, you know. French rationalism, British and uh, you know um, Scottish empiricism, but it's his relationship to Kant, of course, mm -hmm. and you begin to see it that way. So to me, th this is a kind of building block, if you will, or if you know, as a toolkit, it's really a, a, a fundamental text. You know, it's something that really has to be engaged. And and some people have said, just think what Lenin would have been if it was it was this book alongside the logic. Mm -hmm. Because Lenin did not really read the phenomenology actively. It was the logic he was studying. Right. Yeah. So there, there, there was something that was thought of here if he had had the movement of this alongside the logical structures, it may have been a different story. You know, in the Soviet. Who knows? I mean, these are academics I speaking. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, but it would be interesting to think Never that through that. and to go <laughs> through that. And I'm primarily interested me, myself in these inner texts that produce these figures and their thought. I'm always interested in the inner text. What is Hegel reading? What are, What are the underlying texts that are being played out? And then how does he take this up differently? To me, this is a much more interesting way of approaching this than through, quote, its pure logical argument. Right. Right, to, to, to my mind. Yeah, I mean, I, you know. So, I, so Lenin yeah. wasn't reading the phenomenology? No, he didn't read the phenomenology. I had a, an Italian communist friend, uh, uh, <laughs> lives in London now, uh, Virgilio Rizzo. And uh, he was a, a member of the party, but he lived in Park Slope. And he was smart enough to buy a brownstone, four-story brownstone, in 1975 for uh, $75,000, <laughs> worth about six million today is brownstone, anyway. And then I got the capital, he sued 
the Marriott Corporation, they accused him of stealing. He used to work while he was going to graduate school as a, as a uh, person at the Marriott Bar, you know, the hotel in the airport at JFK. And they went after him, they thought they were stealing, they accused him. So he filed a suit, he went to Ramsey Clark's office, you remember Ramsey Clark? Yeah. Well, Ramsey, I think, is still around. He's still living? <laughs> oh my God. He should have given Tennessee to Sanders. No, I used to see yeah. him. Yeah. Used to He's see from him Tennessee. Yeah. No, I used to see him at so the He's the attorney general under <laughs> Lyndon Johnson, who, who became a leftist and a very good, interesting lawyer. So anyway, my friend... He's, my friend, he, he's pretty frail. Yeah, 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 yeah. My friend went to see him and he said, oh, I'll take the case. So what they did, as a ploy in the case, they had him come in, he, reading the Italian newspaper against this big, big, bad corporation, the Marriott Corporation, going after this kind of immigrant who still reads the Italian newspaper. Mm. And they positioned him as such. He won $100,000 you know, settlement from the Marriott Corporation as being, you know, I, di I didn't know, Your Honor, you know, I don't speak English that well. All these people were accusing me of things, you know, carrying the Correa <laughs> della Sera, you know, this Italian communist, uh, so anyway. But, you know, he said, he, he ran around the new school and used to say, if Lenin had only known the phenomenology, <laughs> if Lenin had only known, he would tell Agnes Heller this, he would tell Albert Zemmel this, he would tell these people, <laughs> <laughs> he smiling down on the desk, you know, if he only knew this, this was the dynamite we needed, you know, and he would go on and on about this. Real character this guy. Very, very funny. He wouldn't have yeah. become so locked in. Oh, so that yes. Lenin wouldn't have known about this? Or, or no, he was dead. Lenin right. was dead eight years before, before they discovered this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, not when it came out, it was discovered. Right, right. Discovered. I mean, it may have been there That's the whole time, yeah. uh, but they, they, they did not put that. The 1932. Oh. Okay. Riazanov, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. 1932, that's discovered. Yeah, yeah. That was that, that, that was a hidden text that basically authorized a, a humanist Marxism yeah. and actually justified the Lukáczs, mm -hmm. et cetera, and some of their readings of Marx, right? And, and, and uh, uh, of course, uh, Marcuse. Mm -hmm. These are two people tremendously influenced by this book. Yeah. yeah. Tremendously influenced, yeah. Whereas the Althusserian camp, see, this is when it becomes interesting. When you have this background, you begin to see, okay, how does Althusserian develop? Well, they deny. They say, you know, this is youthful folly, right? In some ways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, in, in some ways. That's, that's what they did. And, and they start, they start, <laughs> and start, yeah, they start with capital, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, in a way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, this is what they, they think, right? In some ways. However, their argument's not great because they say alienation is not really plays out in the mature marks, which it does. Okay. You can find it. Hegelian language is what? still in there. So you know, I always hear this about Althusser. They say like, oh, he didn't. They didn't have all this material back. You know, when he was writing that. Uh, you know. What material? Like they didn't have all this new material on Marx or something. You know. What new material? I'm I don't know. That's what I'm wondering. I, I never understood what they were saying. Like they didn't make. Well, Lukács. I mean, Lukács was aware of 32. Yeah. yeah but Althusser was uh, 14 years old. You know, like there's supposedly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, in the later work or something, for instance, uh, he brings back concepts like alienation or some of these uh, humanist kind of impulses. And, right. And Althusser apparently didn't know about some of them or something, and that's why he was able to write and get away with a lot of that stuff or something. Like, Maybe, but the, like I mean, the, the like Althusserian that. moment was much more, you don't start, you start with a chapter on money and capital. Yeah. You don't start with a commodity form. Right. That's a given. Right. right? So why waste, you know, he says, you know, this is where you begin the reading strategy. So it became a reading strategy, and it became part of the symptomatic reading mm -hmm. that Althusser comes up with, which he borrows from both Lacan and Freud, yeah. in a way. They're, they're really doing symptomatic readings where they're uncovering layers of the text. Yeah. So the, the, the real, the, the task here is to see what's exploding in the margins as well. You know, this is really the thing, what, what are the symptoms going on here? Which is kind of what he was in. doing too, in, in, a, in a certain Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, they're all on the same page. It's yeah. not that far away in, in the end. No, it's true. I mean, you know, again, Hegel was not considered part of the Althusserian moment, whereas Lukács, you know, yeah. and others became part of the Hegelian Marxist yeah. tradition. Yeah. Most of the tradition that hit the United States was Hegelian Marxist. Yeah. Yeah. It was not, it was not, it was not uh, Althusserian or Spinozist Marxism. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really not Spinoza's Marxism, nor was it uh, you know uh, you know that kind of Cartesian French yeah. Marxism, etc. Yeah. And so I was a Hegelian Marxist yeah. in the end. I mean, this is where Sartre went, even though he's trying to re- reorient subjectivity, which is another thing because. The first part of this book, before we get to reason, is really about the formation of subjectivity. Mm-hmm. You know, self-consciousness is about yeah. the formation of, of subjectivity. And this is another thing that Althusser and others are not interested in, is subjectivity nor self-consciousness. Yeah. Right? They're not interested in these kind of things. Yeah, right? They're, they, you know, and, and in a way, the, 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 the switch is to objective and objectivating reason. This is what's going on in this chapter, and why I'm, I'm putting it out is speculative reason again, because I don't think there's a closure on the objectivating reason or on objective reason. And th- there's still room for subjectivity there, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a way. Again, the closure would say that Hegel has reached objective reason, right? Yeah. In terms of the real is the rational and the rational is the real. You know, that somehow the subject is dissolved ultimately, in the object. There's no longer that, that distinction going on. Right? Yeah. yeah. So when I told you that but, I am the object in yeah, terms yeah. of the subject-object, I'm referring to the movement of self-consciousness. Right. I'm not referring to the, the second part of the phenomenology that begins with reason yeah. and spirit. Yeah. yeah no, no, no. Okay? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that the, you know, the Althusserian thing about subjectivity is a little bit tricky though because it's not as though, as though he gets, you know, there's new subjectivities through ideology ultimately that replace the, the sort of, you know, bourgeois ideology or something in a sense. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, to me it's like a tricky notion of subjectivity. It's like kind of a, you know, this, the structural subjectivity is a little bit different it seems like than the, the consciousness subjectivity. It's not that it doesn't go away, in a sense. Like, you always have this moment that, I mean, he calls it overdetermination ultimately or something. You always have this moment of internalization of the structure, right? In Althusser. You know? Yeah, I mean, there's always this over, you know, we're right. all situated within overdetermination. I mean, you could call that. A and the relationship is always to another Hegelian category that we were going over right. last night contradiction. Right. You know, I mean, without the, the tension of the contradiction is always already operating. Right. The problem is most people just stay in the overdetermination without understanding the right. tension of the contradiction. Yeah. So the dialectic breaks down and you don't really have that interplay anymore. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so the commentator.